it's not just about the technology or the idea. It's about how do you make and create environments and places and lead people so that they can do their best work. I'm not going to tell you the 10 steps to make you the best leader in the world or how to lead creative people. I actually just don't think that worked because I think it's very personal to who you are. So let's go to the Wayback Machine a little bit. Um, when I became CEO of Frog, somebody gave me this book, The Art of War, and they were very excited. They said, this is the de facto book for budding CEOs, new CEOs. Be and you probably all know about this, right? It was written 500 years before Christ. It was written by uh, a Chinese general. It's strategies about winning battles. And it's, you know, it's interesting. Now, I paged through it. I read some chapters. And I put it on my bookcase. And recently, the reason it's here is recently I was cleaning out things and donating stuff to the local library. And I came across the book. And I thought about it. And I, I knew instinctively then as I know today, and I don't want to sound like I'm a child of the 60s, but war is not the answer. It's not the only way to do things. <laughs> and for me, I've never had to declare war on a competitor or a client or an employee. I really think about the human side. And I believe the best way to lead and motivate people is to understand people at a very, very deep level and use that to achieve the goals of the organization that you've set out. And this has been my guarding store. Now, like everyone else, as I said, I don't have a business background, but I've learned over the years. I have studied this with great detail on using spreadsheets and analytical tools. You must use that. That is part of business. However, it's not the only part. If you're going to manage a business with people, you have to use something more than spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are one point of information. But I've seen too many businesses manage from the bottom up. They manage from the bottom of the spreadsheet. And that's just not the way to make a successful product, company, innovation happen. In that sense, running a business is not a very rational thing. Because sometimes you have to make decisions that actually don't make sense. I hate this concept of failure. I know there's a lot of like, you got to fail fast. And it's like, what does that all mean? I think, right? Like people, you talk about failure. That's a big meme, right? I've, I've, you know, and I've used it myself at times. And then when I really started thinking about it, it makes no sense to me, right? Because it's a process. It's a journey that we all go through. It's part of life. We're going to learn things. You want us to do that. If you were a research scientist studying a drug or a pharmaceutical or a disease, you have long cycles where we know you're not going to get it right all the time. And that's applauded. In business, you're considered a failure. Well, you're not. It's learning. And I think one of the best things you can do is to clearly understand what are your strengths? What are your limitations? How do you reinvest in your strengths, and how do you bolster your limitations? Now, clearly for me, I'm never going to be, you know, because I didn't have that financial background, that wasn't what I had, I was, I was destined to be. I've had to learn a lot of that. One of the ways I've done that is I have a terrific team around me all the time that understands more financial details than I ever will, and that's been really helpful. Now, what that builds is you build this collaborative effort together. And at the end of the day, making great products, building a great company is all around the collaboration, bringing these wonderful ideas. So it's not, you're not judged by exactly what you solely bring to the table, but you're also judged at the team that you bring to the table and how you put this all together. Now, leadership for me is the human connection, right? And I think, oops, 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 getting ahead of myself here. Leadership for me is the human connection. This is where that word empathy comes in. I love that word because it makes everybody kind of go, oh, it's woo-woo stuff. But um, scientists call this the theory of the mind. And it's the ability 
to really understand the desires and the beliefs of others. Now, it's called theory, obviously, because we don't really know what people are thinking or feeling. We can only intuit that. But it turns out that this, the ability to do this is highly variable. Some people have a very high ability to do this. You've heard people say you have a high emotional intelligence, high EQ. Um, and others are superstars, and you think they're, you know, they're really good. Others have a low variability to do this. But what was interesting, and I found this really fascinating, talking to a bunch of people, you could actually get better at it if you paid attention to it. But it's just not a skill that we encourage people to go and develop, which I'm not quite really sure why, because I think it's so incredibly valuable, particularly as a leader and, and working with people. We are starting to see a lot more about empathy in the, the press and things. There was actually a great article in Sunday's Times about um, Mark Bertolini, who's the CEO of Aetna. Did anybody read that article? It was good, right? I mean, it was interesting just because he has this whole different, this mind-body approach. Um, he brings yoga and he brings wellness, and it's really that kind of looking at employees from a different perspective. So we are beginning to see that more, which is great, but what I find when I talk about this subject is most people think empathy is sympathy. This is not sympathy. We're not feeling for somebody. We're not feeling bad or consoling people. That's, that's sympathy, right, where you have this reaction to somebody's situation. Empathy is understanding their point of view and where they're coming from. And it's not that you agree or you disagree with them, but it gives you another point of information. And that helps you make better decisions. So I am categorical about this. I really believe this. I think empathy is one of the most valuable skills anybody should have if they want to lead. And particularly if you want to lead creative people. To me, it has been just my guiding star, something I've seen work over and over again. And I just really scratch my head and not understand why it doesn't work. Why we don't see more of this. So part of the job, I think, as a leader also, and what you have to do, people have always talked to me about culture because I've worked um, in companies and led companies that had really wonderful cultures. And I think part of the wonderful culture is the type of people that you bring in and how you bring those people together, how you motivate those people to succeed, how you train them, how you develop them how you care about who they are as people, that helps create a great culture. So at Frog, for example, um, nobody really cared. I mean, yes, we had to pay people well. It wasn't as if people didn't want to get paid well. But money certainly, as you know, in people who love their job, <clears throat> money is not the most important thing for them. At Frog, the most important thing for our employees was doing good, social because it was a large design community. It was largely made up of designers or people who worked with designers. And designers, by their nature, solve problems. That's what they are. They're problem solvers. And why wouldn't they want to solve big world problems that they saw? They felt they could help. And so what we did at Frog was we made sure that we invested a, quite a bit of money every year in social good programs. And the last few years that I was leading the company, we partnered with UNICEF so we could put all our effort behind some really big, massive, hairy problems that we went and we solved. And it was amazing to watch the community at Frog really gather around not only that social work, but it really spilled into everything that they were doing with their clients. It was a pretty, 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 pretty happy team. Now, another thing I, you, know, you have to do as a leader is change behavior, right? This is, you're in an evolution, especially in the innovation world, right? That's kind of about change. What I found is really interesting is people are um, very scared and very hesitant about change. But you have to understand your people. And if you understand your people, I keep saying this because it's really true, you can take them through some big, big, big changes. And they may not always agree with you, but they trust you because then you know that you've taken their, their point of view. But what I found is people are always fearful of change, right? 
I'm a believer, like change is going to happen. We can't really stop it. I, so not embrace it. Have fun with it. Do something good with it. And um, it's really interesting to watch businesses, when you talk about leading people, just get frozen and not want to change. And I'm sure out there you all have just a ton of stories about this. Um, it disrupts routines. It's hard. You know, I love when I walk through the airport and in the bookstore, I always see that book. It's always front and center, Who Moved My Cheese? I hope the author's not out there. It's, I don't have anything against the book. I just find it interesting that it, like, there's a book about it because people don't want change. People don't want anything different. But um, I can't say it's easy, but again, if people trust you and they know you, it could be, it could be fun. Um, this is a photo. I love this. This is my favorite, one of my favorite photos from Frog. This is uh, the first month in California when the Frog team came from a little town in the Black Forest in Altenstadt, Germany, to uh, work on the Mac in 1982. Um, I think that when you approach change in that way, it's transformative for a company. Um, it makes the employees more collaborative because they've got to work together. And it's very different than that command and control. If I tell you, you will do this because I said so, I mean, you're not a, their parent, for God's sakes. You know, you're, you're their leader and you're helping them do the best work. Um, and, and when you, they do the best work, you know, yeah, we can, we can get to the moon. Um, now, I don't know how, how many of you are in startups or working in startups or working in that world? So I, I love that world, and what I'm seeing is just a whole bunch of new ways of running a business. And there's this whole entrepreneurial ethos that's going on out there. You know, that concept of command, at least it starts out that way, that concept of command and control is gone. Um, those hierarchical models are put out, and they're building a DNA. They're trying to build a different structure. And I think that's really interesting, uh, because I think when sustained, that's how we're going to change and care um, more about our people. So I'll tell you a little bit about some of the companies that I've worked with, some of the companies I've looked at, that I think have very uh, interesting ways of institutionalizing this, this concept of empathy. So um, as David said, I was recently president of Quirky. Um, does everybody know what Quirky does? All right, I will tell you. Anybody members of the Quirky community? Okay, good, there's a few. Quirky's got an incredible business model. Um, it makes invention accessible to everyone. So essentially, it's got over a million community members. Anybody can join, so I assume when you leave here today, you will all join the Quirky community. And what you can do is you can submit ideas online for products. And if those ideas are chosen, Quirky makes the product. And you can either be a quirky inventor or you could be a quirky influencer. And an influencer is someone who didn't come up with the invention, but will then, uh, quirky will ask questions of that person. They will ask them insights about a, a product or a situation. They will ask them about naming. They will ask them about pricing. And if you choose to participate in that, you will also receive fr some money from that. So it's a really, really interesting model and how you bring new ideas into the community, and how people who may have never had access to actually getting their inventions short of going on Shark Tank or something to that effect, you can really, um, really get your ideas to market. Now, Quirky took the idea of, of empathy, and I, put, I think put it on steroids. Because they have this million people, this could have been a really harsh process. But it was really set up to be uh, constructive, it's tr totally transparent, and it's very collaborative. And we're able to build upon this collective creativity to bring marketable products that solve problems. One of the most interesting things we saw was these are people that were living and breathing these problems, and they would put these ideas forward. The number one, um, the number one submission, by the way, was find my thing. 
find my wallet, find my keys, find my car. So that's interesting. Clearly, no matter how many solutions out there, there's still people that are going to always lose that stuff. But I think in this case, Quirky users' empathy beyond their employees, they've taken it out to this entire community. And you could see it in the forums, and you could watch people when somebody would get too critical, not that critical, you know, you can criticize, but in a, in a constructive way. If somebody got mean about it, it would get shut down by the community themselves. So it was a very interesting way to watch this institutionalizing, this empathetic way of, of doing business. Now, I'm working with another company called Vita, shopvita.com. Very interesting story. The company just launched in November, and what it does was it gathers design ideas for clothing from designers all over the world. The, they're silk screened, they're machined silk screened in about four minutes, in, um, and then printed in factories in Pakistan and India. Um, and the quality is really beautiful. Now, what makes this company interesting is that the reason they've chosen these, fact these particular factories in Pakistan and India is a percentage of the profits go back to educate the workers, which are mostly women. And this is born out of the founder having grown up in Pakistan. Her parents were physicians, and they were in a very, very small town in Pakistan. And as a result of that, they had to homeschool their kids because there were no schools. And so she lived for a stand. Now, she is a, obviously a success story. She came here. She went to, to Stanford and Harvard. I mean, she, she, but she said she would wake up in the morning. She was 12 or 13 years old, and she would get her own books out to teach herself. And she never wanted, she wanted to help her, the, the people of her country, as well as others that she saw in a similar need. So what this does is everybody wins in this situation. Designers really are, are random. They're from, you know, unknown designers from all over get their designs printed. The factory workers are very invested in wanting to make this because they have a stake in this. And, and you want to buy these because not only are they, they beautiful and lovely and all the things that you want to do, but you feel like you are doing something, something good. Now, another company I have nothing to do with, but um, for those of you who play video games, this is Valve Software. Um, and I found this company really fascinating. You might know a lot more about it, that, you know, but I found this interesting. Under, besides the CEO, it's a totally flat structure. There's no hierarchies there at all. So new employees are given desks with wheels, and they're said, go pick the project you want to work on. Go ahead. Which is like, kind of interesting, right? And they feel like they're most important currency is trust. Everything in the organization is open. The source code, the strategy, everybody has access to it. And it kind of flips that corporate convention on its head. It brings this whole sense of openness to a business because it's not creating barriers anymore. I know something you don't know. Um, everybody has to trust everybody. There's no barriers in your way to do something. And in a way, it's democratizing this concept of, of empathy, empathy because if you want to succeed, you have to become, in effect, your own entrepreneurs and you have to understand your colleagues and how they're going to work together and how this is all going to be. And it's really bringing in this whole concept of openness. The, mo the most fascinating thing about this, they quote that their per capita employee is higher than Google and Apple. So clearly they're doing something right. Or it's a great video game if those of you play it. I don't play it, but if those of you play it. So I'm just spilling the virtues of getting to know your employees and getting deep and so and telling you that you know companies that do this are in fact successful. So why isn't it done? How many of you, uh, well, I just had to put a nod into House of Cards. Anybody uh, this weekend do the marathon? Oh, a lot. I did. I did. For, I did. I did. I, I basically stayed up all Friday night into Saturday morning. Why? I mean, I'm way too old to do that. But it was, it was great. So no spoilers, but boy, it's an interesting ending. Uh, 
So I think despite the advantages that empathy brings to management, it's still not being used about. And I'll tell you why. People think it's wishy-washy. People think it's touchy-feely. It's emotional. I mean, I still get that. People will tell me all the time, oh, you're, you're, you're just so emotional. I was commenting in a board meeting a, about a year ago, or no, two years ago, about something. A, a, and, and one of the board members said, but, yeah, but you're emotional. So it was like, like is, I wasn't crying in the meeting. I was merely commenting on it. <laughs> is, that, is that bad? Is that something that's negative? You know, I really feel like if you don't have to think about it, that's okay. So I always have to have a nod to the Ramones and everything that they did. It's one of my favorite bands. Um, and I do believe that everything in life is probably traced back to a Ramones lyric. And one of them, one of their songs is Ignorance is Bliss. And so that's great. If you're ignorant about this and you don't have to think about it because it's not business convention, then you don't have to think about people. And to me, that's really not getting the whole story, and that's really not getting the knowledge that you need. And if, in fact, the whole concept that knowledge is power, then this would then show weakness. And if we go back to our friend the general who wrote The Art of War, we know that being weak never really turns out well. You know, I think that where so many companies drive the bottom line, and we live in this quarter-to-quarter -quarter world where it's very hard to be creative. It's very hard to be innovative because we're, we're chasing these quarterly numbers that it's wonderful to look at businesses that defy that and that will put making their business better and coming out with better products and services in front of well, what's the number going to be that quarter. And I think the whole concept that playing hardball and, and, and bottom line results isn't the only way to run a business. So in general, for me, business is, you know, concept is team sport. I say that, even though I'm not a particular sports fanatic. But I always say, you know, it's, it's this collaboration that you have to work together. You know, I personally never got into the thrill of bossing people around. I'm terrible at that. Um, my strengths are always organizing, planning, strategizing, and looking at people and trying to figure out how do I get them to do their best? How do I have them rise to the occasion? I think the best way to deal with people is to inspire them and not scare them and lead them, not flog them from behind, and comfort them when they fall short, and help them stand up, and don't bash them for failing. I remember one, you know, one, one of the epic fails that I had. Somebody said, well, who's going to get fired because of that? Who's going to get fired? Nobody's going to get fired. We're going to learn from this, and we're going to move on. And if we keep making the same stupid mistake, then there's something wrong with us. But you know what? Chances are that will never happen again. So I don't think, you know, we're little busy bees that work, 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 work. We're people. We appreciate the human touch. And I think in the world that we live in today, where our work and our life balance, our personal life, really become interchanged. Because we are 24-7, most of you, I'm sure, are all dedicated professionals, and it's not like, you, you know, you don't turn it on. My father used to come home from work at night. That was it. Work was over. You know, there was no, he didn't get on the computer. There was no more work until he went to work early in the morning the next day. Our lives are all in a change, and we want meaning in our lives. And we want to feel like we've made a difference. And that's the most important thing that we as leaders could help bring to our employees. So, you know, you can call it empathy. You call it common sense. It, it really all makes sense to me. And I just wanted to share that with you. So thank you very much.